welcome everybody to Making the World Suck Less. Uh, if you don't know our program, I'm Cheryl Heller. I'm chair of a new graduate program. We're now in our second year, and we are entirely conceived and committed to making the world suck less, although that's not the way we generally describe it <laughs> we do, when, we're, when we're talking to each other. So we don't specialize in turning out internet entrepreneurs or people who work in nonprofits or foundations or anything like that, but our students will do all of those things. And the common denominator is a commitment to solve the social issues of our time um, and to use design to do that. Tonight, we are, we've invited you to one of our regular Wednesday evening lecture classes. This one is obviously on steroids. Um, and the purpose of this class is really throughout the year to expose students to as broad a diversity of extraordinary pioneers in social innovation as possible to give people a sense of all the different ways there are to live a life in social innovation. And tonight, um, thanks to our um, faculty who teaches entrepreneurship, Bill Gordon, and to Don Barber, so we can thank them both now. Um, we're excited to have Alexis Ohanian, who's one of the most inspiring entrepreneurs working today. I first saw Alexis at TED India, so I was one of the people who was in the audience screaming and cheering wildly for Mr. Splashy Pants. So if you'd like to learn more about our program, you are surrounded by grad students, and Gila Mera is here also, our Director of Operations. And I will now turn it over to people who should be walking up here any moment. Skylar Brown, who is our faculty for the guest lecture series, and Alexis, and here they are. All part of the plan. Both of us. It's important. It's important. <laughs> Got to look they fresh. They are design students. That's right, you guys. Hopefully yeah. you guys appreciated all the animated GIFs at the beginning. <laughs> We're not too wigged out by it. Some schools, we've done 77 universities. Some of them do not understand what's going on when there's a bunch <laughs> of animated GIFs. And they get really, they're really uncomfortable with it. Are you going to name names? William and Mary. <laughs> That one was the most egregious. They were just, I've just never seen so many confused students in one place, kind of oh, just really uncomfortable, the situation. So you guys handled it very well, so kudos. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, yeah, on Wednesday nights, generally at this time, we're in a much smaller auditorium across town, uh, or same side of town, a couple streets down. Um, and um, this is a really special event for us to be here tonight with friends, with guests, and um, I heard Cheryl thank some people. I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for being here, for your attention, um, for getting out and coming to this, this event, which um, I'm really excited about. Are they, are, you, are they getting a grade for this? Yeah. Okay. But only like 40 of them, so everybody nice. else is well, here good. of their Excellent. own volition. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and... Um, introduce Alexis, and I mean, this is truly a man who needs no introduction from me. Um, presumably, at least the students have read the book, but I bet others have too. Um, I did, enjoyed it very much. Um, so I'm just going to hit some highlights. Uh, we all know who this is, right? Yeah. Founder of Reddit, now Reddit board member. Um, he's now focused, uh, Alexis, on Bread Pig, which I think we're going to want to hear a lot about tonight. Um, given the nature of our program at SVA. Um, Alexis helped launch Hipmunk, um, and also is an advisor, and I was going to say activist. What would you say sure. to that word? Yeah, I'm down. Regarding a free and open internet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to you would you'll take that. I'll label. take it. It All is, right. I, I feel too lazy most days to be really an activist, <laughs> but the, uh, I like to think, yeah, yeah, you know what, I, I tell my friends all the time who are actually on the front lines of this, yeah. EFF, Fight for the Future, that they have my axe. Excellent. So that's, really awesome. Lord of the Rings? No? Oh, all right. <laughs> that's the extent to my activity. I didn't get it. Oh. <laughs> my husband would be so disappointed. <laughs> all right. Anyway, um, and Alexis wrote this amazing book, Without Their Permission, which feels like a really important book. Um, and um, looking forward to sort of uh, unpacking a lot of the ideas that are in the book because um, the students in our program, a lot of them are social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurially minded. And a lot of the speakers we have to come talk to us, um, 
I find some common themes in the questions, and a lot of their questions have to do with how did you do it? How did you get it off the ground? Um, where did you fail? What did it feel like to fail? Um, and tonight, I've collected some questions from our students, so, um, and a, lo a lot of them are along those same lines. So I know you're gonna share something with us first, and then we'll have a little chat. Yeah, well, I mean, what would, would the best order of operations for me to, uh, I guess? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, there's a clicker. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you want me to, like, go through with the, like this? I think, what do you Is usually this comfortable? do? comfortable? I'm new to know. this. You've done it 71 I, times. Well, here, tell you what. <laughs> Let me, well then, but I don't, I wouldn't want you just standing here. How about this? Okay, where grab, do you want me to go? Grab Should a we seat. do it together? Grab a seat. I'll, you don't want, my, I have two left feet and I'm going to trip over you okay, if okay. we're both up here. All right. Um, so okay. you want me to go down? Well, only, yeah, right, yeah. Grab this. I will, this actually, this segues really nicely. This segues really nicely into my talk. Um, yeah, grab, here, no, no, we'll just, yeah. Only because, and also I'm, I shouldn't be blocking the screen anyway. Okay, hold on. All right, now there is, oh, the book's there, okay, yes. We're gonna do it like this, I think. I'll just wait right here. Okay. <laughs> See, this is, and this is an important lesson, like I said, that is gonna come back, it's gonna come full circle. Um, also, uh, I don't see any mobile devices or laptops out, which is really disappointing. Um, please take them out, even if you just wanna ignore me and read Reddit, that's fine. Oh, there's some, okay, good, you're very surreptitious about it. Uh, that's the hashtag, WTP book, tweet whatever you want. Um, or tweet at me. Um, the, the little overview I want to give you guys, and you guys all are designers, uh, and you're artists, and you're makers, and you're creators, and so you can empathize with me and my love of mascots, right? Every single company I have helped start has a cute mascot. It's not required, I just love it. Uh, I started doodling in my notebook as a senior at UVA, which is where the Reddit alien came from. Uh, the bread pig was, uh, there were some um, drugs involved, and the hitmunk chipmunk, that was just because it was originally gonna be called uh, Bounce Pounce, which was a terrible name. And my co-founder's girlfriend very wisely suggested we just come up with a cute animal that was slightly misspelled, so like chipmunk without the C, and I would draw a mascot for it. Um, it's nice, it's nice. You don't need to have a mascot, of course, for anything you do, but I love it. Um, you guys have a very strong brand, recently redesigned logo. I noticed you don't have a mascot at SVA, so I just humbly submit an idea. <laughs> It could work, it could work. And I will say we had an amazing visit uh, to RISD and I learned that they actually had a scrotum as their mascot. No, I'm not even kidding, you can Google this. Uh, which is just like, oh RISD, right? But, but seriously, just throwing this out there. Um, the other reason to have a mascot, if it's not obvious, is that you can get away with anything in a mascot costume. That is of course the Hitmunk Chipmunk in Times Square. And you'll notice the cops are arresting the sword swallower. Because of course, the cops see a guy with swords and they're like, let's see a permit. But they see someone in a chipmunk costume and they're like, keep dancing. You're looking great, keep it up. The, the point though of this talk is not mascots, it's just to tell you about the world, okay? It's amazing, right? It's huge. One thing it is not though, despite what this man will say, he has great facial hair, it's very compelling, but it is not flat. That's not true. We know that, the ancient Greeks knew that, all of us know that, but the World Wide Web is. As long as we have an open internet, as long as all links, all bits are created equal, it's the world's largest stage and library in one. And that is powerful, extremely powerful. So bad. It's actually, the power glove is a terrible way to play games. But hear me out, hear me out. I was a kid, I was a middle schooler. When my parents, who didn't really understand technology, they didn't have a ton of money, they got me a computer, they put it in my room as a 486SX, and they gave me an internet connection. It was a 33.6 dial-up. You had to listen to your internet back then. All right, this is a long time ago. And for me, it was life-changing. I felt like a god among men. I felt so powerful sitting there. Yep, 16-year-old Alexis. I was not worried about the prom, but I was busy making websites. And it was so empowering, right? Because I could make something from my bedroom. Millions of people, well, tens of people could see. <laughs> Right, realistically. And even though it was just me hitting reload, it still felt like a lot. And you never forget your first, right? Mine was GeoCities. And Silicon Valley slash Hills slash 4924, first website. It was this lame Quake 2 fanboy page with like animated, uh, animated GIF flaming skulls and like blink tags and marquee text. Like it was an awful looking website, but it was my first and it was so cool. 
And it wasn't long thereafter that I thought, man, I could start building this for other people. And I'd find myself on message boards and I'd talk to nonprofits. And they wouldn't know I was this dork in my parents' bedroom. They just knew me as someone who could do something they couldn't, who could build websites. And so I started building websites for nonprofits, not for money, but for pride. Because these adults all over the country had no idea. And I could do something they couldn't. And that was valuable. That was huge. I haven't been able to shake this drug ever since. And you know, the incumbents today, like Bain said, right? They merely, no, I could do that better. <clears throat> you guys don't want to hear me do my Bain voice, do you? Oh, all right. Did you see Bane Cat, by the way? Yeah. Made the rounds. Oh, it was amazing. Okay. <clears throat> they merely adopted the internet. We were born in it, molded by it. All right. So the point. Oh, thank you. Thank you, SVI. I know that's not the first time you guys have had the Bane voice uh, for a lecture, but here's the thing. You know, you know it's not the first time. Here's the thing. What's amazing about this is really we are all figuring this stuff out, right? We don't know. We know software is affecting things. We know the internet's affecting things. We don't know where it's headed. We do know the incumbents really don't know what's going on. In most cases, and I know it's easy to make fun of this, so I will continue. Uh, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying. You've had that phone call, right? And this is exciting because this is one of the huge advantages our generation has for those of us who are lucky enough to grow up with access to this technology. Is that in, likely, in all likelihood, you guys have had access to this for far longer than I have. And there's a kind of fluency that comes with this that gives us a tremendous advantage. Because like I said, we're still just all figuring this out. And quick spoiler, all right, ideas alone are worthless, right? In an innovation economy like the internet where distribution is handled with a few ones and zeros, where the cost of creation is, is really just time, ideas alone are worthless. Creating things, doing things, making things are what is going to be valuable in this new economy, right? If you wanted to change the world in the Industrial Revolution, you had to open a factory. Today, you open a laptop. That's a really big idea. And that's really cool because it means any one of us can get started. Now, I got lucky because my senior year of college, I learned about Y Combinator. Steve and I, my Reddit co-founder, Steve Huffman, we were going to build something to eliminate lines. It was going to be called My Mobile Menu, or mmm. And <laughs> it would let people, hear me out, it would let people order food from their cell phone so they wouldn't have to wait in line. So this was back in 04, 05, still very early. We thought people could bypass lines forever, be so efficient. So we started building it. We talked to every restaurant in Charlottesville. We started working on a prototype, and then we applied to Y Combinator for the first round ever. And we thought, this is amazing. They're going to offer us a little bit of money to get started. We'd work for an entire summer writing code and, and building and getting users. And we thought, this is perfect. We're about to graduate. So we applied. We got invited for an interview. We went up to Boston. Long train ride up from Virginia. We went up to Boston. We met with them. We pitched them. Best pitch of our lives. And that night, we went out and celebrated, because we'd, we'd done an amazing job, obviously. And then we're out drinking, celebrating. We get the call, and they, they told us we got rejected. And that sucked. Um, so the good news is we were already drinking, so we could just continue doing that. But now with misery instead of happiness. And the next morning, we were hungover on a train back to Virginia when we got a call. And they said, listen, we still don't like your idea. <laughs> but we like, we like you guys. You're willing to change your idea, work on something that's not mobile because it's still too early for that, something in a browser, we'll let you in. So we said, all right, all right, we'll do it. We'll do whatever it takes. And so we went back to Boston, sat with the founders for an hour, and came up with anything else, something else we could do in a browser. And what we came up with was, oh, we're going to create a place to find out what was new and interesting online. So we were pretty much one hour into a company we had just come up with. Right? For the last year, we'd worked on something. And once we got rejected, we thought, all right, we'll just dispose of it and try something new. And so we thought, all right, this is it. This is our plan. We're going to graduate. We're going to go move to Boston and start this thing. And that's us. That's us the first day of Y Combinator. We had just graduated. It was back in 2005. And something you may notice uh, is that I'm already wearing a shirt with our mascot on it. We hadn't even had a We had no company yet, but I already had a mascot, which is not the right order of operations at all. I'm just saying, that's what happened. And you'll notice from this photo, Steve actually, he still looks the exact same, which is crazy to this day. That's because he's a vampire. And the last thing is much more subtle. And this is a very important point, which is back then, we had no fucking idea what we were doing. And let me actually go so far as to say, we still don't know what we're doing. I still do not know, just like you saw a little earlier, what I'm doing. No one does. Anyone who fronts like they have it all figured out, 
is either lying or delusional, okay? Experience, expertise, those things help tremendously. But they don't mean you have all the answers, right? Life is not a paint by number. We're all just figuring it out. Even if you want to be an entrepreneur or not, no one has all the answers. We're all hacking it. And as soon as you realize that, when as soon as you realize all the people you look forward to being greater than, to, to all the impacts you want to have, all that stuff, they all are feeling the same way. And so don't let that feeling of not knowing what you're doing stop you from figuring it out. Everyone feels that way. This is, this is the first version of Reddit, okay? That's it. We took this screenshot like a minute after we launched to the world, okay? I know what you're thinking. Yeah, it's janky, okay? That's clear. Uh, how many of you actually are Redditors uh, to this day? Just out of curiosity. Oh, great. Upvote, 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 upvote. Thank you, upvote. Uh, you guys are also the least productive people here, but <laughs> that's fine. Thank you for outing yourselves. You'll notice this is pretty simple, right? Just a few headlines. I made the first submission ever, which was a link to the Downing Street memo, and you'll notice I have negative one karma. Yeah, that's because Steve is a dick, and <laughs> my co-founder and best friend downvoted the first ever submission to Reddit. <sighs> that hurt. But, but, this was it. We had gotten into the world, and yes, it's janky, but look, I got news for you. Everything starts out that way. This is the first Facebook. Remember that? Janky, all right? The first Twitter? <sighs> Seriously? This is publicly traded now. Just by showing this, I am knocking the share price down another 5%, all right? These are how all these things got started. The first version of everything is janky. You're not doing this for an A. You're basically doing, it's like pass fail at this point, right? You're just doing it to pass. You wanna make something just useful enough. And that's okay if it's janky. Even the first Iron Man was janky. Remember that? Yeah. But it solved a problem, right? If it's good enough for Tony Stark, it should be good enough for all of us. And so look, this is now minimum viable product, whatever they call it, but whatever it is, whatever act of creation you're doing, get it out there, get in the habit of doing, of making, of shipping. And today, yeah, Reddit is huge. We, we were a top 50 website, and it still feels like this little project that me and Steve started fresh out of college with no clue what we were doing. And you can't get obsessed with where, where it might be, you just need to get obsessed with trying to make something that 10 people or 50 people love. And whether that's your Etsy store, your Kickstarter campaign, your blog, whatever it is, you don't start with daydreaming, you start with creating, with doing stuff and finding feedback from the people who are there supporting you and caring. And, and never forget waffles. <laughs> never. Now I know there are no waffle houses here in New York and it breaks my heart, but oh, there is a waffle house in New York? We gotta talk, all right, we'll talk after. In New York City? Oh, sir, that is. <laughs> I am this close to flipping over this table. I know there's one near Bauhaus on 14th. Yeah, that is an IHOP, but that is not, no, 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 that is not a Waffle House. <laughs> I, well, all right, well, here's, we can talk about the Waffle House franchise. The point being, this changed my life because I was going to be a lawyer. I was going to be an immigration lawyer. And for two years in college, I obsessed over my GPA because that's what aspiring lawyers do, right? And I obsessed over the LSATs. And then one morning, I walked out of an LSAT to get waffles. And it changed my life because I realized, you know what? I want waffles more than I want to be a lawyer. So I probably should not be a lawyer. And instead, I just said, well, I'll figure this out. Now, waffles are important for a couple reasons. One, because of the epiphanies. But two, because it reminds me of a great story that happened like six months into Reddit. And that was when we were invited out. We were in Boston at this point. Things were going really well. And we were invited out to Yahoo. And this is like a pivotal moment for us because we had never been to Silicon Valley, right? And an executive there invited us out. So he flew us out. We met with the whole team. They gave us like all the M&Ms we could eat. And they were like, let's hear it. Let's pitch us Reddit. And so we got like a, I don't know, two minutes into it. And this dude just cuts us off. And he's like, hold on. <laughs> How much traffic do you guys have anyway? We're like, well, we just launched about six months ago. It's growing week over week, 10, 12,000 users. And he laughs at us. He's just like, you guys. <laughs> That's how he laughed. <laughs> you guys are a rounding error compared to Yahoo. What are you even doing here? I'm like, well, you invited us. Is that, is that like a thing you guys do at Yahoo? You just invite? Young startup founders and make fun of them? <laughs> like, can we have some more M&Ms? Like that, that meeting did not go well. We had made a mix CD for this thing. We were so excited and <laughs> it's true. Few of you, I, I appreciate the few of you who understand that reference. In like five years, that reference will no longer, no longer matter. But we had made this mix CD and we were listening to it all the way back to Boston. <sighs> but the first thing I did when I got home was I printed out a little something and put it on the wall next to my desk. And it just said, you are a rounding error. I put it on the wall next to me. 
and I looked at it every single morning because that dude continues to motivate me to this day. And it became this wall of negative reinforcement that I would add to from time to time. And I say this because, look, there are going to be constructive critics in your life who are amazing, right? They're the ones who make us better. They're the ones who keep it real. And then there are going to be haters. There are going to be haters. Haters going to hate, right? Scientifically proven. We know that. But be the honey badger. All right, honey badger, honey badger don't give a shit, right? Eat the haters for breakfast, like waffles. Use them as motivation. This dude, he's still in tech. He's an executive at another company, and I'm sure he doesn't remember that meeting at all. But I want to meet him again one day and thank him. I mean that. I genuinely mean that. Thank him. Because to this day, he still motivates me. And those words still motivate me. So find that motivation. Use that for as much good as you can. Because there are going to be those people in the world regardless. All right? Use it as motivation. Because now is the time, by the way, to get started. For those of you in school right now, please, I'm so jealous of you. You've got such a head start because failure is an option. It is. It really is. Okay, and it doesn't feel that way because we spent our entire lives in a school system that tells us that failure is not an option, right? You have to get the good grades to pass the next level, do well on the next test, right? Life doesn't have a GPA. Life is about setbacks. Life is about, frankly, sometimes sucking, right? Because, well, sucking is the first step to being sort of good at something, right? This dog knows what's up. And then the fact of the matter is, look, like if you guys remember nothing else from this, just remember go forth and suck. Obviously, don't take that out of context, but. <laughs> or whatever. Live your life. Take it out of context. YOLO. Whatever. <laughs> like, this is, this is the time. Because you have more creative freedom now than you will probably ever have in your lives. And you have, like I said, the world's largest library and stage at your disposal. What do you want to learn today? What do you want to share with the world today? These things have never been as available as they are now. And what's crazy is some of my favorite stories that I've picked up along the way just would blow your mind. For example, uh, University of Georgia, fail out. This kid couldn't stay in Georgia to save his life. He tried everything from bond trading to Applebee's, and he failed all those jobs. Couldn't hold a job at all. And then one day he told his friends and family, listen, I'm going to move to New York. And they were like, really? What are you going to do in New York? And he was like, I got it. I'm going to take pictures. Like, really? You don't even have a camera. And you suck at photography. Like, you're the dude with the finger in front of the, the lens the whole time. Like, you're terrible. It's a bad idea. And he was like, I know. But I want to get a camera and I want to learn. And so he did. His friends and family were like, dude, good luck. He's a host. He doesn't have a chance. But he moved, got a camera, and he was terrible. He was a terrible photographer. He'd never done it before. So he starts a little blog, and he starts obsessing over the craft. He's shooting all the day, all day day, all night. He's finding inspiration online and offline from photographers. Months turn into years, and soon, three years later, that total failure from the University of Georgia is Humans of New York. Brandon Stanton, who is now one of the most viewed photographers in the world, millions of people, see this dude's photos every day. Three years ago, he was, by all accounts, a total failure. And he's photographer. How did this happen? How does this happen without the open internet? I don't know. And you talk to Brandon today, and it's so inspiring because he wasn't the first person to decide to start taking some photos in New York, but he did it his way, and he obsessed over it, and it wasn't easy. He still sleepless most nights while he's consistently improving his crafts, but I don't know how that story happens without the internet in three years. And these are the things that make me happy. Right? They're the things that make me feel good about where things are headed because it means more people getting the chance to reach that maximum potential for being awesome. And I have a little illustration here, the bread pig. We spoke about this earlier. Right? If you can imagine, all right, I started this thing as kind of a lark because I wanted to help a friend of mine get his book published. Um, XKCD wanted to publish a book, and I was like, I don't know how to publish books, but I'm going to do it for you because you deserve a majority of the profits because you're the artist. Right? I'm just a dude putting dead trees together. And he was like, OK. And so we did. It worked out really well, and before I knew it, it was a book publisher. And then we started helping other artists, like this is Zach Wiener of Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal. He got one of his books. He really loves his book. Uh, <laughs> helped him get his book published, and I've started working with webcomic artists over the last few years because it's a fascinating industry, right? Webcomics, as the name implies, could not have existed without the web, without the internet. Now he can make comics like this that probably wouldn't sit well next to Family Circus, he can make comics like this and draw a following of millions, literally millions. That guy, Zach Wiener, he was a closed captionist before he started doing this webcomic full-time. This guy's job 
was to listen to the words coming out of Kim Kardashian's mouth and type them down <laughs> all day. That is soul crushing, okay? <laughs> Clearly not the best value of his talent, and so now he's able to create this. He's able to build a following. Zach Anner, a dear friend of mine, was, he has cerebral palsy, but he's also a comedian, an amazing comedian. There aren't a lot of people with cerebral palsy on TV. However, Zach decided, you know what, I just need YouTube. Started building a following there, started creating videos there when he was discovered by the internet, eventually by Oprah for a minute. Now he's working with Rain Wilson at Soul Pancake. He's making the films he wants to make, he's doing the comedy he wants to make, and in an industry where historically not many people with CP ever would have gotten the chance. And he's amazing, he's incredibly talented, and he knows just how much his life could have been different if he didn't have access to this technology. And he started going on the list, all the people I started meeting, this is, the, these are the Chambers brothers, and, and one of the members of the Chambers brothers, Lester Chambers, put up this photo about two years ago. Because you see, when he was making those records, gold records, like the one he's holding, he wasn't getting paid. Because the deals the record companies signed with him, shocker, were pretty, pretty awful. He just didn't get anything. For years he waited, he didn't squander his money, he just never got it. And so he got so fed up, he posted this photo online and said, hey fans, I'm broke. I've been broke, because I never got paid. And all those gold records you loved, I never got paid for them. And so it went viral, right? It hit Facebook, Twitter was the top of the, our music subreddit. Everyone said, what can we do to help? So Lester sat down and recorded a video and, and tried something a little new. He tried telling his story and people listened, people responded. He was on the front page of CNN because he was running a Kickstarter campaign. It was a relatively new website back then. And $60,000 later, Lester, at 72 years old, got the first album of his life that he actually owned. And he started looking at it and you're thinking, all right, well this isn't a magic wand that's gonna change what happened to Lester or musicians like him, but it's showing a new way for a whole other generation of artists. And you start getting hopeful because the way he talks about the internet now, he sounds like a wide-eyed tech founder. Now this, this is a choose your own adventure version of Hamlet. That's crazy, right? What, what kind of advance do you think the average book publisher would give for a choose your own adventure version of Hamlet? Well, I'll tell you what Kickstarter gave him, $580,000. And that was from his fans, from random people all over the world who said, yeah, that's a really cool idea, Ryan North. He's the guy who does dinosaur comics, right? He, he just decided one day, hey, I wanna make a choose your own adventure version of Hamlet. And his fans said, yes, yes you can. Here's a half million dollars to get you started, right? And again, these are things that didn't exist five years ago that are happening. It's not that this is an end point, this is just the beginning, and it gets me really excited, right? Like this bread pig illustrates, but at the end of the day, all it's doing is helping things move more efficiently. It helps artists connect with their fans. It helps creators connect with their supporters more efficiently. And look, history is full of examples of near misses, right? One of my favorites was about, a, this is about 30 years ago, was a dude who, he was doing a lot of work with the ASPCA up in Washington State, and he loved animals, but it was soul crushing work because he saw what humans would do to them. It just was, it was eating him up inside. He couldn't keep doing it. So he'd find a way to relieve stress by drawing in a comic in a local newspaper up there in Seattle. And, and people started to like his comic, and he thought, you know what? If I can syndicate this, if I can go to other newspapers, I can make enough money making my comic so that I won't have to keep working at the ASPC. I can find ways to help animals another way. And so he takes a vacation, actually he goes to San Francisco. And while he's there, he thinks, oh, let me stop by the Chronicle. Let's see if they, you know, want my comic. Turns out they did. Signs a syndication deal. The day he gets back to Seattle, he gets a notice from that original newspaper saying, I'm sorry, your comic's a little too offensive. We're gonna cancel it. And if this dude hadn't taken that fortuitous vacation to San Francisco, we would have never had the far side. So that's why, that's how close we were, right? To missing out on, I mean, Larson, one of the best comics of the 20th century, right? We never would have had that if he hadn't taken a damn vacation to San Francisco. And so no, none of this stuff is new, right? Supply sometimes met demand in the past, just barely, right? Because of a fortuitous vacation, but the internet helps those connections happen easier than ever. And then I started thinking more about this and I started thinking about like the history of art and patronage, right? The reason we have so many amazing works of art was because a rich dude was basically like, hey artist, spend your days making art. And that, that worked actually pretty well. We got a lot of amazing art out of that, and I thought, well, you know what, that's cool. But how do we modernize it? What's the internet equivalent? And I started looking around, and I found that there were people actually working on this, right? The internet helps connect us in a way that we've never seen before. So you enter a site called Patreon. And I met these guys, I don't know, eight months ago. And it was a similar model where they thought, all right, I'm an artist. I just want to make art. 
I don't want to think about the next project or the next book I have to deliver. I just want to make stuff on a recurring basis. And I don't have like the Catholic Church to fund my artwork. Instead, why don't I rely on everyone, on all of my fans to chip in maybe a dollar a month or five dollars a month, whatever they can afford, just to know that I will be able to create my art. And what is my art? It could be anything, right? It could be, I don't know, it could be Jack Conti, who's one of the founders of Pomplamoose, uh, as well as Patreon. Right, it could be my cool music videos that I put up on YouTube and I share with everyone. It could be Zach Wiener, the comic from earlier. It could be Allie. Now, Allie's amazing. I didn't even realize this was a thing, um, but she does a little something. Hey, let me show you. The video is the only best way to explain it. Welcome to another Raw Tingles. If you've never joined me for Raw Tingles before, um, the basic idea is that um, it's just a sort of no-frills trigger video with no theme or special effects. It's just 100% focused on triggers. Um, I like to keep it really... So she just whispers and opens little packages that sound really cool when opened on a microphone. And she's amassed a following where she, that, that are paying her $3,000 a month right now to produce videos of her whispering into a microphone, opening interesting packages. Now, who am I to say, I mean, this is amazing. That's so cool. There is an audience of people who are supporting her whispering into a microphone, opening packages. Wow, okay? And what's so cool is none of this stuff Welcome. is, whoops, none of this stuff is at an end point, right? This is all part of a process. This is the very end of a five month, 200 stop tour where I took this message. These books are not to scale, by the way. That would be terrifying, but <laughs> absolutely terrifying. But I took this message everywhere because I was so convinced this stuff is happening everywhere. And I tell you, I was so impressed. From packed halls in Athens, Ohio, to, I mean, every nook and cranny of this country and Canada, our hat, is full of people who are creating and who are doing using the internet. And it's, it's exciting, because it's gonna mean better stuff, I hope. It's gonna mean people like Maya. She's been working on this storefront for like seven years now. I met her down in Atlanta and it's amazing. She wanted to start her own fashion line, so she started, she wanted it to be eco-friendly and so she was very particular with the materials she used and she was doing so well, she actually started a nonprofit as a result and, and she's just been, it's been growing gangbusters. I actually discovered her at a TED Women Conference. The, the thing I forgot to mention was she's also 14. And you start looking at this and you're like, I am so, I was so lazy as a kid, right? But this is the hope, right? This is the hope. If the connected web lets someone like Maya reach her maximum potential for awesome as an apparel creator and philanthropist at 14, something is right. And so I kept meeting so many of these people. These are just a fraction of the stories. The fraction of the stories that I've shared with you are just a fraction of the ones that I've seen on this trip. And so I hope all of you can take this message and these ideas and go do stuff. Okay, historically, right, the gatekeepers are all still there. They are still there, no doubt. They're not just poof, gone. But every one of us that gets access and the skills to make the most out of that access is one more strength, is one more win, right? It's one more person who gets the ability to take those ideas, bring them to the world's largest stage and library, share them, and collect them. And that means more power for individuals with great ideas who want to do stuff and change the world. And many of you right here are going to be able to do that, right? The fact we can even talk about this and I know I don't actually speak French. I don't actually know what entrepreneur means, but that's what it should mean, right? It's not like there are entrepreneurs and there's everyone else. Everyone is capable of being entrepreneurial. That's what the internet enables. What do you want to learn? What do you want? There's a YouTube tutorial right now to teach you everything from Python to knitting to whatever. It's there. And it's something that the world has never really seen before and we're still trying to figure out. But you all are in the best position imaginable because you have such an opportunity right here. And the fact we can even, even talk about this gives us a tremendous amount of privilege. And so I, you know, I wanna leave you with a positive message like this one. Courage Wolf knows what's what. It's as simple as that, right? Have ideas and do them. Whatever it is, get it out there. Get it out in the world. And then always surround yourself with those people who are gonna motivate you, who are gonna push you, who are gonna be, you know, you're the average of your five closest friends, right? So, so find the right people to surround yourself with and take full advantage of this technology and remember this is a throwback to when video games used to be hard. They used to be a long time ago. And that is that, look, you know, when you're on your last life in a video game, you usually play your hardest because, you know, the game's going to reset. And this is something I realized many years ago as a kid and something I applied to life now, 
right? We all, notwithstanding resurrection or reincarnation, we all have zero lives remaining. And so my final bit of advice for you is, is quite simply to take full advantage of this one, right? Because just the fact we can even be here right now talking about this stuff gives us a tremendous amount of privilege and responsibility. And so I hope we all make the most out of it. And whether, whether you want to go and start, and whether you want to IPO a company, win a Nobel Prize, become a world-changing artist or designer, creator, wh whatever it is you want to do, when you do it, just give me a shout out, okay? Because I want to take all of the credit for your success. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry I had to relocate you. That was so fun. Okay, all right, good. Great presentation. Good. You're really good at that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I was making all of it up. That was actually, incidentally, 80% of that was just lies. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Lies. I'm kidding. It's all real. No, no. <laughs> it's all real. Um, all right. So this could go in a number of different directions. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, a lot of these questions were inspired by the students. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to start because um, a lot of your presentation was about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And you're in a unique, first of all, you really embody the spirit of entrepreneurship now, it feels like. Is that a good thing? Yeah. OK, good. Okay. No, it's kind of fascinating. And I wonder, um, um, just the position that you're in, hearing mm -hmm. a lot of pitches, mm -hmm. the position you're in with Y Combinator, mm -hmm. what are some of the qualities that an entrepreneur needs now? I mean, a lot of your presentation was encouraging um, our group to go out and do the thing. Just but what are some other, what are some qualities that really define the successful entrepreneurs today? And, and I really want to broaden this to, like I said, this is not, maybe it's because it's a French word, I don't know, like, <laughs> there is often this, like, you know, right, there are entrepreneurs and there's everyone else. Like, I re the internet really does enable all of us to be thinking entrepreneurially. That doesn't mean you have to start a company. It just means you're taking the initiative to create the thing you want to create, to do, to seek out the knowledge you want to seek out and solve a problem or make a thing or what have you. And so the best entrepreneurs are the ones who are relentless in that regard. They're the ones who, you know, the, the, they realize, they see, they see problems as things they can hack. They, they, they see, and, and it's, it's the kind of thing where I mean, I see, this, I see this in friends of mine who are artists. I see this in friends of mine who are scientists. Um, right? Once you realize you have this resource that'll, that'll somehow get you to a solution, that is the internet, right? you start seeing question, You start seeing things like, oh, I don't know anything about blah, 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 as an opportunity to be like, you know what? I'm going to figure out blah, blah, blah. And none of this stuff is easy, but the best entrepreneurs are the ones who come into, come into situations where they realize, I don't know what I'm doing and they figure it out. And they're just good at saying, all right, you know what, the six things I just tried clearly are not working, let me try another approach, let me, and then they have this kind of relentlessness. And, um, and I see this, you know, I talked to Brandon Stanton, right, about being a photographer. He gets asked all the time, how do I be you one day? And he's like, you know what, the truth is, you take a lot of fucking photos. I'm quoting, I mean, he's like, you just take a fuck ton of photos. He's like, I meet plenty of people who are photographers, <laughs> And I asked them, so what do you do on a Tuesday night? And they're like, oh, yeah, usually I go out with my friends. We go party. I might smoke a little. And it's like, that's great. Live your life. That's cool. But like, if you're a photographer, and this is Brandon talking, he's like, take fucking photos all the time. And, and you know, it's in his experience, like, and yes, there is, there's an undeniable amount of serendipity, luck, whatever you want to call it, that goes into it. But um, a lot of it just comes down to that relentlessness. Um, again, there, you, you can't deny the overarching, you know, the, with it. Of the things that are within one's control, the relentlessness one is the that's the major lever. That's awesome. Grit, right? Now yeah. they've done studies. Grit is and, something that's really important. And we just don't, unfortunately, and I don't have an answer for this from like an education system level, oh. but um, I feel like we are we are raised to seek, we are raised to figure out how to optimize to pass the test mm -hmm. and not how to just figure shit out. And, and I mean, I guess that works, and it's worked for a while, but um, in the internet economy, it seems like the, the people who are having the success being entrepreneurial, again, in the broadest sense of it, are the ones who go into it knowing, like, all right, look, there is not an answer for this. It's not C. It's not B. <laughs> it's just figure it out. That's awesome. Cool. Um, so no more grades. <laughs> no. Do you guys actually have grades? We do. Oh, okay. Yeah. We can work on that. No more grades. No, don't you please no. I'm flashing back, and then it's not a good flashback for me. Um, and, and actually, I'm, I'm glad that you um, <clears throat> you covered the Yahoo story. Oh yeah. Because we've talked a lot about um, anger 
mm -hmm. as a great motivator, especially when you're trying to change something. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and Joseph, one of our students, Joseph, asked about that um, um, that particular, that rounding error mm -hmm. quote. And uh, maybe could you talk a little bit about, I mean, we're talking about resilience. Can you talk about, and your sense of humor seems to be an important part of this, but mm -hmm. um, that particular incident uh, and or any others where, I mean, you said you had a wall of, what negative, did you call it? Negative reinforcement. There you go. Can you just tell us about that, how you sort of like have taken those moments that could have been disappointing and turned them around? Uh, sure. I, I, I was really fortunate for a lot of reasons, but in particular, I had I had two like ludicrously supportive parents. So there was always a foundation there of two parents who were just amaze balls. Like when it came to supporting me, but it still I mean I had like seven participation trophies from basketball camp, and I still can't dribble. Like we're we're from the generation we got trophies for every damn thing, and. Uh, it was when we got rejected from YC, although that was a fleeting, that was like a 12 hour thing or like this, this was, the, I mean, this was something we really had our hopes up for. We really respected this person and then to be like treated like that, it hurt. Like it really, it sucked. And, and I think, and it's different for everyone, but I think the, the best way for me to deal with that um, was to try to use it as motivation, to put it on the wall and to prove someone wrong. And this is stuff, I mean, this is stuff I remember hearing about like football coaches doing. I mean, you hear, listen to enough hip hop, you'll hear people rapping about this all the time. Have you ever, have you heard Michael Jordan's acceptance speech to the Basketball Hall of Fame? I've got a feeling this is gonna be really good. It's really good. Okay, I'm gonna Anyone even listen that? to this. Oh, got one. that's worth seeing. Okay, yeah. all right, this is all of our assignments. He talks about, basically he talks about all, all the players along the way. <laughs> Who made him furiously angry? <laughs> like it was like him at his most competitive, oh, wow. yeah. and it was very controversial because people thought it was like he really disses a lot of people. Um, but it's it's beautiful. He's wow. saying like you fueled me. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I mean, I'm. I wonder. I guess I could <laughs> use the therapy session to explain to me the the roots of this. I really I have no ill will towards him. I say don't get me wrong. I'm not a total monk. Like there are a few people, but um, I feel like they've really earned it. Um, this was just a dude who was just being a dick, and and I know for for someone who's had you know for someone who's had the amount of privilege that I've had as a straight white dude like in the states, um, there's not there's not a um, like I realize I'm still coming at it from like first or second base, um, but I still feel like I don't know I. I I feel like the way I wanted to deal with their criticism as, I mean, like I said, there's the constructive stuff, which is amazing, but the unfounded yeah. stuff, like yeah. the strip, the way I wanted to, to deal with it was to be motivating. And I don't know how Steve, I actually should ask Steve what he thought about that weird wall I had. But, um, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, uh, given everything that was going on at home, um, and my, my mother was ill during most of Reddit, and um, given everything that was going on at home, I, I had a base where I woke up in the morning and I still knew, like the instant I woke up, no matter what I was dreading with work, that it wasn't gonna be as bad as what she was doing and going through chemo and doing all that stuff. And like, that was a foundation to be like, you know, at the end of the day, this isn't that bad. Like, I'm just, I'm a founder of a startup. Like, we're living in a crap little apartment eating ramen and writing code, but like, it ain't that bad. And, and so to, I guess, have something on the wall that I could use as motivation to help fuel it from the other way. Um, I don't know, I, it just, it, it worked. Um, and I encourage everyone, find whatever it is that motivates you, but certainly do not let the haters get you down uh, to not. Awesome. Um, all right, I'm gonna share a question uh, inspired by Sarah, and she um, asked, can you share something about, something you've learned about maintaining balance um, or about finding balance when you're maintaining a free speech site and advocating oh, yeah. for a free and open internet, mm -hmm. and then having the responsibility mm -hmm. also of being the founder of such a site. Um, sure, I mean, this is this is something I've talked about with executives at Twitter, um, pretty much any one of these social media sites, right? The internet has given a printing, like I said, largest library in stage. The internet has given a printing press or a soapbox, whatever metaphor you want to be, microphone, to everyone with an internet connection. Um, the cost of that is everyone with an internet connection has a microphone. And there's a clear line in our laws that prohibit certain types of speech, and I have a total support of prohibiting those types of speech. Um, when it comes to the rest of it, it's a, sh it's, it's 
I mean, it's the same way I feel about the, the printing press and the microphone. Like, ultimately, you can't, I don't know, I don't know what, what Gutenberg was asked, but like, you ultimately can't control the full extent to which the platform is used. And whether someone's gonna post something stupid or ignorant or offensive on Reddit, on Twitter, on any of these things, um, if it's within the law, it's an unfortunate reflection of humanity. Um, the vast majority of the content that gets produced is actually benign or good, like the vast majority. Um, but the result is not all of it is. And trust me, it's something I wish I could change about humanity. Um, I don't have that power. I wish I did. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the end of the day, that's what we're left with. Mm -hmm. Good. Cool. Um, and do you feel like this is related? related question from Robin? I mean, is there any responsibilities you've come to recognize as a creator? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this free and open internet, flat. Are there any responsibilities as, that you have as a creator, do you think, any of us, when we're creating content and putting it online, or as a user mm -hmm. um, in this scenario, and what are they? Well, I think, I mean, actually, it was interesting. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who is the real father of the World Wide Web, was asked this in a Reddit AMA, and, and he essentially said the same thing, and I'm not comparing myself to Sir Tim Berners-Lee, but that you... I mean, it's ultimately a tool, right? It is a, like a hammer or like anything else. The internet, the platforms we build on it are tools. We as individuals should absolutely, like, tr like, like a hammer, like a printing press, like a microphone, try to be handling it with respect and with dignity and in the right way. Mm. Um, but ultimately, we don't have control on how individuals use a hammer or use a social media platform or anything. Um, I can be responsible for myself, and I should absolutely be responsible for the stuff that I create as a like as a creator of content but as the creator of a microphone or a printing press i still have to give that printing press to someone else to print or microphone to speak out of yes okay great um this is a, this is an interesting question i thought mm -hmm. from josh um but uh in the last era industry was primarily about utilizing and controlling natural resources mm -hmm. okay i'll let you get a grasp yeah. of that what would you say the natural resources of our generation will be well, I still think it's going to be oil. Um, I mean, that's not, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to end anytime soon. Um, it needs to, but um, wow, I guess I hear about the water thing every now and then. This is really out of my purview. Uh, the good news is internets is a pretty sustainable resource. I mean, the, the oh man. Yeah, no, I wonder, I wonder if it's a little abstract, mm -hmm. the question too. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a limit to human in on uh, ingenuity, is there a limit to, um, can people become exhausted, for example, by the fact that we are creating all the time, or, mm -hmm. you know, is there some kind of a natural resource that like we attention. may exhaust without? Wow. Um, I mean, maybe the answer is oh no. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, there are certainly some days we probably all feel that way, uh, <laughs> keeping up with everything online, yeah. Huh? Well, hold on. Let me throw one thing out, and then I'll phone a friend. I think, you know what? Here's why I don't think it's going to come anytime soon. Because if you consider the tools that people had at their disposal to create, whether it was knowledge or the stage, those tools were generally limited to a very small percentage of the world's population. And, you know, if you wanted access to the world's knowledge, what, good luck, your library, like, like, it was very, it was hoarded, frankly, it was hoarded among the wealthy and powerful. Um, the fact is, we haven't, we've only tapped into but a fraction of the world's creativity and ability. So on a global scale, I think we got a ways to go. Um, I'm, also, I'm also, I skew pretty optimistic about this stuff. Um, but I'm excited about it. Um, it's, it, because I know, Someone wrote a book about how Google's making us dumber, The Shallows, I think it was. Um, and the, I mean, I'm biased, obviously. Um, but if it means I'm going to suck at Trivia Night because I can't remember the Civil War was from 1861, 1865, like because I'm so used to Googling it, but it means the rest of the world can now view the world's knowledge about the Civil War at a, at a click, like it's worth it. Mm -hmm. I will gladly take that like dumbening of some <laughs> trivia players in the wealthier parts of the world for a broadening of knowledge and access and a stage to the rest of the world. I know I'm simplifying that dude's book, but I've, I've thought about this a lot. <laughs>
Great. Yeah. Was that a satisfactory audience member? We can tweet about this afterwards, too. Yeah. Um, all right. So maybe uh, one of the questions we had, um, actually it came up in a number of different ways, but was about the future of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe from your uh, vantage point with Red Pig, or um, what does the future of philanthropy look like, do you think? So I, I wanted to do an entire book about this, but I could only, like the way I was, unfortunately the way this book was going to get sold is if like, hey, Reddit founders telling a story about entrepreneurship. I only did a chapter about nonprofits, but I could talk about this for days. Um, this is... This is your audience, by the way. This is so badly in need of innovation, this whole world. Um, but what's exciting is the ones that are doing very well. I talk about Donors Choose, but they're kind of OGs of it. Like everyone calls Kickstarter or Donors Choose the Kickstarter of schools, but really, you know, Donors Choose is around like seven years before Kickstarter. Kickstarter is the Donors Choose for creative projects. Uh, there is so much work to be done to bring transparency and accountability to philanthropy using technology that just never exists. Like it, it did not exist, and you're seeing, so Donors Choose is a great example. Um, there's one that actually went through Y Combinator last year called Watsi, uh, which is bringing that same model of transparency to medical procedures all over the world. So you actually, with the child and parents' consent, you see the photo of the child before with the cleft lip. The partner, uh, might be like Partners in Health in Haiti, says, hey, we need $600 for this operation. Everyone ships in, a dollar, whatever. Every penny goes specifically to that procedure. After the procedure is done, the child and the family come back, follow up, there's a brief little story, and you feel amazing. Like you actually, you know this is not Sally, Sally Struthers standing next to some poor kid crying. Like this is actually 100% transparent and accountable. And so what really excites me is as software eats the philanthropic parts of the world, we're gonna to start to feel a kind of accountability and transparency we've never known. And it's gonna mean you'll never, you'll probably never wanna just give $20 to the Red Cross after a disaster because you, you know that 60% of it maybe actually goes to help and 40% of it's for overhead or for who knows what. Um, technology enables this transparency to happen. And then what gets crazy is it only takes one. So what I mean by that is, so Watsi, the nonprofit I was talking about earlier, um, every single one of their financial transactions is in a public Google document. That's free to do, but they're the first ones to do it. No nonprofit had ever said, hey, we should just publish all of our financial documents. But now that they have, everyone can look at that and be like, well, they're doing it. Why can't you? Forget Charity Navigator and all that stuff. Like, this is next level transparency because this nonprofit wants you to know exactly how they use all the funding, exactly where the resources go. And once a few do that, it sets a new standard. And so. I'm hoping, you know, I still look at, I pick on Kim a lot because she's Armenian too, but you know, we can see what Kim Kardashian is having for breakfast every day through Instagram, right? That's pretty trivial, right? At the end of the day, sorry, Kim, but that, that's trivial. We don't have any, anywhere near that kind of access into where most of our donations go, let alone what our government is doing. Um, there are so many other areas where this technology, pretty basic technology can give us more access. Uh, and I think the future of giving is going to make someone who gives $10 feel like they're giving $10 million because they will actually, right? That's the way you name buildings at a university, right? You give enough money. Um, if you give 10 bucks when, when your university comes back to you for that donation, you're going to be like, wait, what is this going to do exactly? But if they can tell you, look, it's going to help another student. It's going to be a scholarship for so-and-so. It's going to, like, if you can start to bring more access, and I'm sorry, your fundraising department probably hates me, but... That's what's going to drive people to give. That's all we, 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 we do it because we want to see that it's making a difference. And $10 can make a difference because in aggregate, it can let amazing things happen. Cool. Great. Um, I have, OK, I have, we have five minutes. So I'm going to have two Lightning questions round. in mind. Okay. Um, the first is, um, is investing opening up at all? Because that feels like one thing that like we can all create, we can all crowdfund, there's still a lot of money being made mm -hmm. by people who are in a position to be, be investors mm -hmm. in companies. And do you see anything happening with the, that? So crowdfunding, there's crowdfunding and there's crowd investing, right? There's the, the former, which is, hey, here's $20. Like, I want this to exist. Maybe I get something in return. There's crowd investing, which the Jobs Act is, is sort of materializing, which will say, hey, here's $20. You are now a partial shareholder in that cafe down the street or you're a partial shareholder in so-and-so's startup. Um, that's, that's exciting. Um, there, is, there is a peril, which I think, I think we'll be able to safeguard against, which is like the sort of common scam where we've, and this has always been a problem with like snake oil salesmen, 
Um, so long as people are protected, like you don't want, th these are obviously going to be risky investments, but so long as the people who are making these investments are fully aware of the risks, and Kickstarter actually did a very good first step in including that section in their crowdfunding stuff, we'll see what the crowd investing platforms look like. But I mean, as a whole, most investors, angel investors, for instance, they lose their money. Like they're, it, it's still an extremely risky investment with the hope that maybe it pays off. Um, I think what's, what's more interesting to me is when any one of us cannot just invest in like so-and-so's startup, which is okay, that's interesting, that's cool, but like invest in so-and-so's like cafe or small business, right? Access to capital for small to medium business owners, which are the ones that every politician says are like the backbone of the economy, blah, blah, blah. Like it's true, but none of those people can ever go into a bank and get a loan because the banks don't want to talk to them. And well, that's a whole other thing. But like the fact is, Access to capital for the people who are actually creating jobs, for the ones who are actually adding value to communities, is totally illiquid. It just doesn't work. And I hope this can be a mechanism for that. I hope, and it, there's a half dozen sites trying to do this that are getting ready for all the Jobs Act stuff to come to fruition so that we can invest in our local cafe, or we can invest, and, and we're not necessarily doing this for like, this isn't like, hey, we're gonna retire on this, it'll be the next Facebook. It's like we're doing this because, look, it feels great. We're contributing to this thing in our community we want to exist. And yeah, maybe there's a little bit of upside, but uh, it, it's, it's clear that that market is still horribly inefficient. And the good news is more and more tools are coming online and the costs are falling. Like certainly from software, um, people can actually, you can get started with your storefront. Um, you know, Etsy is an amazing New York based startup, right? The fact that Etsy has been able to do what it has done is kind of mind blowing because people have always made crafts. Like they've always handmade stuff. They just never had a global market where they could efficiently. And I know eBay kind of was there 15 years ago, but forget it. Like Etsy's built the place where someone can just say, hey, I want to see if the world wants to buy my jewelry. And I've met, like I said, I've met, um, there's a duo in, oh man, St. Louis called Scarlet Garnet. And these two women met each other on the internet. They had separate Etsy stores. They liked each other's stuff. And they were like, hey, what's up? Your stuff's cool. You're in St. Louis? They're like, yeah. So they met. A year later, they're opening a storefront, like a brick and mortar storefront in downtown St. Louis called Scarlet Garnet. Check it out. They still do most of their revenue from the internet. But because there was zero cost to get started, they could build a following. They could build an audience. They could build the revenue and then open a storefront. And they're part of a rehabilitation of downtown St. Louis. And like these two women would have been just as awesome at making jewelry. 10 years ago, they, they would have been just as amazing. Every one of their friends and family would have been like, oh, your jewelry's amazing, you gotta get this to the world. And they would have had no clear outlet. Now they can. And that it feels like a net win for the world because two people who are extremely talented are doing the thing that they love and are great at and we all benefit from it. We all get better jewelry. St. Louis gets a cool store in downtown and you know we're making progress. Awesome. Uh, f f quick final question mm -hmm. I have to ask. One of your great interview questions is mm -hmm. a list of great oh, interview yeah. questions. The last one. My spirit animal? Yeah, what's your spirit animal? You have to tell me what your spirit animal is too, though. Okay. My spirit animal, uh, because I, I, do, I get asked this, is the uh, the black bear. That's an important distinction. The brown bear will just eat your face. Brown bears, grizzlies are, if, if you ever encounter one in the wild, you want to play dead and just hope, because you'll probably die. But this is why we live in New York. We don't have to worry about bears. Um, a black bear, however, they prefer berries they're not necessarily going to eat your face. So if you see a black bear, you want to get as big as possible and like make noises, like like rah, throwing a stick. And odds are the black bear will just be like whatever and, and walk away. Um, so I'm not the eat your face bear. I'm the like, hey, what's up? All right, I'm not going to mess with you. And I go eat some berries. X. And how about you? <laughs> horse. What kind of horse? Like a like a, a free like a running a free horse. I I grew up near Assateague, so all the wild ponies oh, we'd go yeah. camping. Beautiful. Oh, oh my goodness! And you're like horse, you're just chilling there. What are you doing? Yeah. What? And the horse is just like I'm just chilling. I'm hanging. Yeah. I don't need humans. Hug you. Yeah. Why? Well, so be, cool. be careful. Those wild ponies. <laughs> you're a bear. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> all right. So um, we're gonna wrap it up, right, Hila? Okay. So <laughs> thank you so much, Alexis. Oh, this thank has you been so much. Amazing. This is so great.